Hello and welcome to Policy Watch. Focusing on India's employment scenario today, we'll be speaking to our guests about first, deficiency in job creation across the country and what are the government's efforts in creating more jobs. And second, the row over the job quotas in the private sector. Well, employment growth in India slowed down drastically during the period of 2012 to 2016 after a marginal improvement that we saw between March 2010 and March 2012, according to the latest available employment data that is collected by the Labour Bureau. To shed more light on the issue, we have in studio today two esteemed guests. We have Mr. K.A. Badrinath from the Financial Chronicle and also Santosh Merotra, Professor of Economics at JNU. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining me here on the show. Professor Merotra, if we could start with you first. The numbers we just talked about, of course, I just, of course, talked very briefly. If you could in detail give us a sense of how the situation is at the moment, according to the latest figures that we have, and what are the factors that are leading to this alarming rise in unemployment? The rise in unemployment is among the youth. And that's far and away the most worrying thing. Why it is happening is fairly straightforward because uh, the growth rate of the economy has been consistently declining. Uh, I mean, if you were to, it's true that we may be the largest, sorry, with the fastest growing large economy in the world, but that's partly because, you know, the global economy itself has been growing slower. But in any case, the more important point is that we need to grow fast if we are going to absorb the rising number of young who are joining the labor force uh, and a rising number of those who are educated who are joining the labor force. So, so that's point one. Point two is that, of course, uh, the economy is compared to the period between 2003, 4 and 11, 12, mm. when it, the economy was growing at 8.4% per annum by the earlier method, it's been growing at, at much less than that. Uh, so we may well be the fastest growing large economy, but our, we are there on a whole series of counts, the growth is, is low. So the, um, at the same time, I think what we need to recognize is that our young are getting more and more educated. There has been a silent revolution sweeping across the country in terms of education. Uh, so, we have seen a dramatic increase in secondary enrollment between 2010 and 2015 mm -hmm. uh, from 58 percent to 85 percent and this has happened with gender parity. In other words, girls are also you know, getting educated. Now, inevitably, many of these young would now be wanting to join the labor force. But they would join the labor force only in a situation where jobs were growing. Yes. But, they, but the, those jobs, unfortunately, are not growing. And the result of that is that, um, as the Labor Bureau data is showing, that the, the number of youth in agriculture are, are, is rising, which is the opposite of what used to be happening to about, till, till about 2012. Because the numbers in agriculture were for the first time in India's history after, after 2004 5. That's what mm -hmm. the NSS data told us. Mm. Because there were non agricultural jobs being generated. Uh, and unfortunately, that process has slowed down very, very dramatically. The last point I want to make is about the credibility of the Labor Bureau data itself. Mm. Because that has been questioned and I find the questioning itself questionable. Okay. Uh, because I have examined the data and you see, we all know that the sample size is as large as the National Sample Survey uh, Employment and Employment Rounds of 2011, 12, 9, 10, etc. There are some issues with the data. I, I don't, I, I, I can discuss that in detail. Perhaps mm -hmm. now is not the time. But the point remains that this is fairly credible data. And so your question is a very reasonable question. Mm -hmm. And yes, even if we don't take the Labour Ministry data uh, to heart, if we don't take it by the book, the very fact is that it's not just the Labour Ministry figures, but it's also the other surveys that have been con Correct. conducted. They are also showing Correct. CMIE. that there has been a deceleration Correct. as far as CMIE. employment is concerned. So Absolutely. that in itself should worry the government. Absolutely. Uh, but you also have, yes, we are seeing a slowdown of sorts in the economy, but growth as such, at least in the past 10 years, if you could say, India has grown steadily. But as far as you look at the employment figures, it has been slowing down steadily as well. Shouldn't there be a relation 
to how your economy is growing and how jobs are being created as well. Why do we see this kind of uh, you know, imbalance in these figures? Two things. First, coming to the CMI data that we mm. were here talking about. Uh, the January-April 2016, as for the CMI data itself, which is fairly new, is about 401 million people. And by May and August, it has grown up to 403 million. And by September and December, it has gone up further to 406.5 million people mm -hmm. who are actually both in the organized, unorganized, form and non-form sectors. Okay. For 2016. But after that, during January and April, it says that about 1.5 million people have lost jobs post demonetization and they say that the CMI attributes this mm -hmm. to fairly, I mean says that it is demonetization. The Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council says that no it is not demonetization, then what do you attribute the growth to mm. in the first three quarters, the preceding three quarters. So there's basically even that the CMI gives a lots of guesses. They mm -hmm. don't attribute anything to and leave us guessing as to what could be the factors. factors. Okay. Number one. Mm. Number two, in terms of you know no correlation between uh, the GDP yes. growth and job uh, creation, jobs mm. creation that we are talking about. There has always been this debate that uh, you know is uh, should we have growth? I mean jobless growth. Or should it be inclusive mm, growth? Mm. Should it be you know productive growth? Should it be you know job, I mean job creating growth? And that kind of a debate was always there during Dr. Manmohan Singh and after even that. now, yes, the last ten years of UPA and even during this regime, there has been a lot of debate. My guess is the challenge will be to expand the job market, which has not happened, at least or has happened in a very little way. Mm -hmm to that the problem is that you're slowing of the economy which has happened in the last few quarters mm -hmm. but only the silver lining in this is that exports are picked up 25 percent the exports are picked up unless you do manufacturing the exports can't pick up mm. second the iip data that we are talking about in the last quarter yes iip data also shows that there is a pickup especially the manufacturing, the infrastructure, the capital goods. If the capital goods are, I mean, the sector is growing, that means the manufacturing has to grow. New uh, areas of manufacturing have to start. So if this is the case, and if this trend continues, mm. and if this growth extends to agriculture, which is about 4% last year, and if this continues to 4% this year, perhaps we are better off. Okay. And we can safely say that the economy is bottoming out and there is only a revival that is possible. Mm -hmm. That seems to, if that is there, perhaps the uh, jobs will definitely be back in the, on the table. Okay. I'm more little optimistic in yes. the sense that, okay, possibility is there. Yes. Not everything is lost, is okay. what I feel. Okay. Uh, uh, Professor Merotra, you know, uh, Arun Jaitley, the finance minister has said that, you know, government, it's not the government or organized sector is, uh, you know, that actually creates jobs. It's actually the SMEs, you know, those by self-employment. Those are also factors that add to, of course, the employment figures. But at the moment, you know, most of the figures we get is of, obviously of the organized sector. But do you uh, see that uh, growing in all the figures that we've seen so far? Do you see that also growing to a certain extent? Uh, as far as what the government is claiming to say so? Well, the data doesn't bear that out, that, mm. that's, that jobs are being generated there. Mm. It's a very important sector in terms of jobs. Its weight is very large. Mm. Obviously, the unorganized segments of, of manufacturing, of construction, as well as services is very, very large. And I'll come to that in a second. But I think first we have to re-establish and firmly establish the fact that there is a serious jobs issue had it had there not been a jobs issue i don't think there would not there there wouldn't be such a churning of uh, on this subject okay uh, or within the government itself yes. now, i just want to i i will come back to the sme issues okay. please don't think that I, it's a very important question that you've asked but we need to recall 
that those looking for work in Manrega, according to Ministry of Rural Development data, increased very dramatically in the last quarter of 2016. Hmm. By that I mean in from October to December. Why would the, those looking for work in, under Manrega increase? Because the informal sector, the small enterprises which you were just asking about, lost jobs in huge numbers because there was a very severe crash crunch. Hmm. So, in other words, what happened was that in at the beginning of November of 2016, before demonetization, about 3 million person days of job of work was created under Manrega. In the next month, in dis, uh, early December, the data said that 5 million person days of work was demanded because people were obviously coming back yes. from the informal sector where they had lost jobs and where business had gone down very severely. Uh, they came back and were looking for work. By early January, that number had increased to 8.2 million person days. Now, that's a phenomenal increase mm. from 3 million to 8.2 million over a two-month period. Having said this, there is much that can be done today which doesn't require necessarily a large fiscal stimulus because one of the big concerns th that is being debated is do we need necessarily a fiscal stimulus. Mm. For the, per, from the point of view of the SMEs, you don't necessarily need that. Yes, of course, some increase in expenditure would be necessary, but also what is necessary is a redesign of programs. For instance, most of our non-agricultural employment across the country is in clusters, in geographic clusters, about five to 6,000 clusters in the country, about 1350 uh, clusters of these are modern industry clusters, the remaining 4,000 odd are traditional artisanal product manufacturing clusters mm. across the country. Now these clusters are clusters essentially of MSMEs, meaning micro, small and medium enterprises, enterprises. Mm. Who are, which are all producing in one geographic location similar products. Now if the, we, what the government, MS, uh, government's ministry MSME has is a, something called a cluster development program which has been around for about 10 years or so but it is severely underfunded mm. it could be in other words for instance if the funding today is a thousand crores per annum it could easily be increased by 2000 crores okay. very rapidly without causing any ma fiscal crunch mm. and the program design could be improved okay. secondly mm. In these, for these same clusters, there could be much better infrastructure provision by the government. Now, you and I know that the government of India has a good program called Amrut, the Atal Mission for Renewable of uh, Small and Medium Towns. Mm. Now, I don't believe that there is currently any synergy between the Ministry of Urban Development in the choice of sit towns and cities. Okay and the, the clusters which is where the jobs are. Mm -hmm. If the investment among in Amrit programs and Amrit is reasonably originally reasonably well funded because when the government came to power it announced that we are going to do 48,000 crores over a five year period for about 500 towns. Mm -hmm. uh, that's about 100 crores per city over a five year period. Now mm. the point is if the choice of cities was such yes. that you focus on the where on the those particular geographic clusters, clusters which are, are actually beneficial. Correct. Yes. Because they are they are the hub of jobs mm -hmm -hmm. in non-agricultural jobs. So careful planning is something Absolutely. that def definitely needs and that is something that is required even in other schemes that we're seeing which are the flagship programs of the government make in India or a skill India. They don't seem to have generated the kind of the interest perhaps has been generated, but the kind of employment opportunities that it could have done so, it's still lacking on that front. And is it the lack of planning? Is it the lack of, you know, a pragmatic look at uh, the situation? Is that what is lacking? See, many of the new programs that uh, the Smart City Project, uh, the Amrit Project, talking about, uh, designing part has taken a lot of time perhaps, mm. as, as far as I understand. The Smart Cities, for example, 
if uh, if the smart city project happens, hundred smart cities have to be built. Huge infrastructure has to be created. There would have been a lot of jobs. Mm -hmm. The bidding process itself has taken a lot of time because the states have to come on board. It cannot be unilateral. And even the designing part of the program, there is a lot of consultants involved. So if that is the case, no, obviously in one or two years or three years, there's going to be a lull. So much of yeah. work okay. that is happening. Mm -hmm. My guess is this is the right time that these projects have to take off if something big in terms of jobs has to be created. Okay. And unless that is done, that is not possible. Second, coming to the issue of stimulus, I'm not a great believer of, you know, you need to have a fiscal stimulus and all that. A lot of effort has gone into the fiscal consolidation that we are seeing today. Mm. So let us not, you know, uh, um, I mean, wither away just all the gains that we have made. Mm -hmm. My guess is to build an environment where uh, it is conducive for private companies to invest. Okay. They should come forward to do it. Till now, the public expenditure has been very huge. Mm. That is where you have sustained the economy and some amount of jobs have been created. That is the case. So more and more has to be done in terms of private sector jobs, which they have to come along. Mm -hmm. You cannot run your economy on one engine. So the, unless the private companies come across, it, the jobs creation cannot happen, number one. Number two, agriculture sector, we have to sustain the uh, growth of 4%. Only then we can, uh, like many people are getting into agriculture. Yes. So if that is to be sustained, mm -hmm. so the agriculture growth has to be at 4% plus. Mm -hmm. The third point is exports. For the last so many years, so many months, 11 months, you have seen a double digit growth. And your external environment has been relatively more benign. If that is the case, then exports you need to give a big thrust, especially to the Latin American countries, okay. or the African countries. Unless your export manufacturing picks up further, <coughs> then the jobs creation cannot happen here. Mm -hmm. So these are the three, four issues which needs to be focused upon. Okay. There's, there's nothing called, you know, you can't just get frustrated that nothing is happening and all mm -hmm. that. The frustration cannot be the answer for it. No, that's perfectly fine, working but accepting uh, the reality and trying to work on it, that is also one way uh, to also look Let at the make, situation. Yeah, yes, yeah, yes. I, I want to sort of make uh, two sets of points. One is about the need for packages for labor-intensive manufacturing sectors. You know, labor-intensive manufacturing sectors are four or five in our economy. They account for about 50% of all manufacturing jobs mm. in the economy, organized in mm. and unorganized. Those are wood and furniture, leather, food processing, textiles, and garments and apparel. Now, the government had a year ago <coughs> provided a package for garments and, text, uh, and apparel. The other four sectors have been relatively neglected and they are job creating sectors mm. in manufacturing. So in other words, the government needs to think about the pro uh, potential for packages for these other four labor intensive manufacturing sectors and they would actually underpin the exports of manufacturers that some, many of these sectors actually undertake. Can you imagine if food processing was to seriously take off in our country, mm. how much of the food that is currently getting wasted, fruits and vegetables in particular, would then get utilized and you know how many jobs would be created. So one is sort of simply the sheer crop agriculture or the non-crop agriculture, but the processing of that mm. would generate many jobs in labor intensive manufacturing. The okay. second dimension which I must speak about briefly is that you know in the 25 years since economic reforms began, India has not had an industrial policy. Mm. We, have, we got a na national manufacturing policy in 2011 which never got implemented because UPA went into policy paralysis. The, the Department of Industrial Policy and Promotion is currently working on industrial policy. But, you know, we need to put an industrial policy which is in consonance with 
trade policy. What do I mean by that? You see, it's what has happened in our country is deindustrialization has occurred so that the share of manufacturing and total output has not grown in 25 years, nor has share of manufacturing and employment grown. Industrial policy means that an inverted duty structure which has gotten generated in the last 10, 15 years, inverted duty structure means that you know finished products are yes. cheap hmm. and you can import and raw materials for producing domestically are more expensive because mm -hmm. tariffs are high. This began to be changed for electronics by the finance minister three years ago. The result is electronics manufacturing is growing. Okay. Automobile manufacturing grew in our country in the last 10 or 15 years because there was no inverted duty structure. But the remaining major manufacturing sectors, chemicals, steel, uh, aluminium, capital goods have been decimated by this inverted duty structure. That has to be a critical dimension of the industrial policy okay. combined with trade policy. Okay. I'm running short of time and I have to discuss another topic, of course, here on Policy Watch. We tend to discuss two economic policies. One, of course, we've discussed about job creation. Hopefully, you know, the government is looking at it carefully. Like Mr. Badrinath is pointing out, perhaps it is a lull. Perhaps we will see a revival of sorts and we're hopeful on that front. Meanwhile, we are also talking about uh, what Mr. Rajiv Kumar had said. Uh, the, you know, he had, of course, claimed that there should be he is against, uh, you know, giving a quota in the private sector, stirring a, once again that debate. What is your stand on that? How do you see that? See, uh, you cannot uh, restrain the private sector. Just because jobs are not happening in the public domain, it cannot, you cannot put the responsibility on the private sector. Yes, private sector has to create jobs, mm. but in its own pace. You cannot say that okay, there should be quota for uh, private sector jobs uh, and maybe there are few politicians who have asked for it. For example, the Karnataka chief minister has asked for it. For example, the Bihar chief minister who is in alliance with the National Democratic Alliance uh, is in favor of such a thing. Hmm. But just because the government policies are not creating jobs, uh, should we ask for our demand for you know jobs quota in the private sector is the moot question. Mm -hmm. Second, normally the left parties had supported such a thing, saying that okay at least there we will uh, be able to uh, create some jobs. Mm -hmm. But now perhaps I'm not sure what is their stand at this point of time. My guess is the private companies must be allowed to run on their own, mm -hmm. not sans interference, sans quotas, otherwise the open market economy will not function Okay. the okay. way you want it to function. Right. So my guess is that Rajiv shouldn't, I mean, I think he is uh, right in saying that okay, job uh, quota should not be there. Mm -hmm. All right, very quickly, I just want to make two or three points about this very quickly. Yes. One is that jobs in the government have not been growing for the last 20 years. And that's a problem. If jobs in government were growing, there wouldn't be this kind of demand made that, oh, let's put a uh, reservation for the private, on the sector. private sector. The owners in the private sector. That's right. Mm. How can jobs in the government grow? They need to grow for the police. We need more judges. We need more doctors and nurses. We need more secondary school teachers, especially yes. in... So we need more jobs in government. Mm. And there's no question about that, in which would provide jobs for reserved categories. There is no need to sort of... And in any case, currently, government jobs do go unfilled in res re reserved categories. So we've got to fix the problems in the education sector so that uh, uh, the reserve category young hmm. actually get the, the, kind get of the skill training, that they require get the education to not the rely training. on a quota. Correct, absolutely. correct. All correct. right. That's not sustainable. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So we've of course discussed several issues that are of course where the government is lacking and not particularly this government. It has been successive government, the policies in general. We do know where the problems lie. Let's hope and pray that, as Mr. Badrinath is pointing out, on a more positive note, we will see a revival of sorts when it comes to the employment figures. That's it, though, on the, on the show on Policy Watch. Thank you so much, Mr. Badrinath. Thank you so much, Mr. Merotra, for joining me here on Policy Watch. Uh, do join us again next week for other policies that we'll be looking out for. But for the moment, that's it from me. Thank you.